What's up, 49ers faithful? We are back with another episode of the 49ers Web Zone No Huddle Podcast on the Odyssey Network. I'm joined by, we got a full house today. We got Brian Rennick, we got Al Sacco, we got me. Man, it's it's been a while since the three of us have been on the pod together, but we got a little bit to talk about today. A little, a little fun stuff. And don't get little, used to it. You guys got vacations coming up, so it's going to be uh, a lot of me, <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> A lot of yeah, Al think, talking to himself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Seriously, mid July it'll be Al and I, and then it won't be till won't be until around August probably that we get the three of us back on at the same time. It is. Just with, it's gonna just enjoy this show because it's gonna be a while before the three of us are back on. Our probably probably be late July, early August. So most likely when there'll actually be, be something we'll be, to talk about. So that also, you know, you'll be ready for camp. Ready to happen. Yeah. You're say, so you're saying that Adam Schefter's report on Trey Lance not having a trade market and us talking about quarterbacks again isn't something to talk about? Oh, my God. We have other things to say this show, but <laughs> in looking for, for quote-unquote news, I guess the news uh, at the end of June was this. is uh, Adam Schefter was on Pat McAfee. And what he said, I don't know if you guys heard this, but it kind of confused me a little bit. So I listened to it, and he said, basically, he said what he said was, there was no trade market for Trey Lance, and the 49ers didn't have any trade talks with teams. So did they try to trade him and there was no market? Or did they not try to trade him and no teams caught? I was kind of confused with what did how did you guys perceive that? I was confused with what he with the way what, what he meant. I I mean, I I interpreted it as and, and this would go against what the 49ers have said, but it, it my interpretation was the same out that the 49ers wanted to shop Trey Lance or wanted to trade Trey Lance and there just wasn't anything uh, available to them. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I am hard pressed to think that they would be willing to do that pre-draft. I said that his, I said that if they did, it, it would be pre-draft because after the draft, like what's the point? Um, and so, you know, maybe they maybe they tried to just briefly, um, mm -hmm. knowing that they had Darnold in house, right? If if Purdy was wasn't going to be ready, uh, but it also sounds like this team has been really confident in Purdy's recovery for a long time now. You know, they have so. talked, they have talked pretty consistently uh, in a positive tone about what their belief is in his timeline, and they haven't really wavered from that, and so. With that level of confidence and with Sam Darnold in house, I, I think they could have thought to themselves, "Hey, let's see if if we can get something." Right now, I don't necessarily think that they were willing to trade Trey Lance for pennies on the dollar. I think if somebody w was going to give them something that they deemed valuable, then then sure. But um, I don't think it was a we got to trade this guy no matter what. It's not a you know it's not a Jordan Pool for CP3 type trade that they were looking to do. Um, you know the Warriors just trying to get rid of Jordan Pool, but um, but yeah, I I mean it also just feels like things are slow and Adam Schefter and Pat McAfee needed something to click on and 49er fans are easy marks these days and uh, they just went for it. I know you two aren't Warriors fans, but really quick, as an aside, what's the football equivalent to that? Like you trade a, an inconsistent, erratic player who sometimes you know puts up numbers for an aging veteran who puts up numbers but is never has never won a championship. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I think. This mm. is the football equivalent of that Warriors trade, the pool for CP3 trade. This is the equivalent. You just traded Go Jimmy for Garoppolo for Philip Rivers. That's what you did. Oh, okay. I would I, I, trade. <laughs> <laughs> I would have taken that sure. <laughs> I'd have taken that trade for sure. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know. Football's weird because I, veterans and you're seeing it, you're seeing it with running backs now. Like once you hit a certain age in football, it's, it's different. It's more like maybe you could compare it to a baseball trade with something like that, where you get a guy who just hasn't hit yet to the veteran, who maybe you're hoping can, can find something. I don't know. But yeah, looking at you know, Schefter went on to say it. It was kind of refreshing hearing his interview though. Because he talked about the trade and then he talked about sort of, listen, they signed Darnold on the first day or whatever it was a free agency. So he was a priority guy. The legal tampering and, period. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's not, it's not like they signed him three weeks in and we'll, we're taking a flyer on you. Like it for him and for them, it, it was obviously a priority. They actively but he also them. said, he also said, Lance has every opportunity and he does. 
he can come in and have a great training camp and then Sam Darnold is whatever. Maybe, maybe he's an afterthought. But Brian, you brought up a great point. They've been steadfast in that Purdy's the starter, and they've been very positive about we like how everything's going, his rehab is going, everything's on time, whatever. It's it's they've been very positive in it. So when you look at it that way, as much as we want to talk about Lance versus Darnold and, and Lance's upside and can they save Sam Darnold, this is a QB two competition. Mm-hmm. So the loser of this with Brandon Allen, who isn't great, but he's certainly a serviceable QB three, lurking. The loser of this may end up somewhere else. In bringing in Darnold when they did, they've been in the building with Lance. That we've said this, they they see something. If Lance does not show out this summer, he's probably going to get dealt before the end of the year. I, I still really believe that. I'd like to keep him and see, but at some point they have to recoup at, assets for him. Is the trade market going to be good for him if he's bad this this summer? No, it, there's still going to be no trade market for him. But if he shows something, maybe somebody will take a flyer. But this was, look, we'll see how the next couple months pan out. But if this doesn't turn around, this was a disastrous trade. And again, I have talked about this before too. I don't want to hear it's Purdy versus Lance. They still lost two two first round picks. They still have mm-hmm. other parts of the team that needed to get replenished that didn't happen because of this. So it's a disaster if they have to get rid of him or, or he. he I guess at this point he's not the starter, right? But we'll see what happens. But um, it was—I don't know. I, I just thought again, it's just—it's—it's it's not going away, and the trade stuff isn't going away, and it's not going to go away until you know probably at the end of camp. To be honest with you guys, yeah, I, I don't even know if they're going to even get anything for a trade for him because look, he has four games of experience on tape, and very little college experience to fall back on because you could you could look at Brock Purdy and say that well he has eight games, there's a limited sample size. He had a college career where he was pretty successful, where he started 40 plus for games. 40, yeah. exactly 40 plus games. And he yeah. has that that track record of being able to play at a at a major in a major conference at a at a relatively high level. You can fall back on that. With Trey, it's different because he doesn't have that coming out of college. He played so little. So I feel like a lot of things are working against him in terms of finding a trade. And you may just see an outright release at some point. And that's just the worst, the absolute worst case scenario because you have to ask yourself if you're another NFL team, you're not even going to spend a seventh round pick on a guy that has already had several major injuries and you mm-hmm. don't even know anything about him. Cause you didn't scout him. You didn't draft him. You didn't sign him. So there is no attachment. Like the Niners, they have some level of attachment to him because they scouted him and signed him. And they, they know him in that well, in, in that sense, they quote unquote know him because he's practiced with them. They know his tendencies. If you're the, you know, the, the Tennessee Titans and you have, well, I mean, that's, that's a bad example because they, they've got, they've got, uh, you know, they have a uh, bunch of shitty quarterbacks. <laughs> no, but they have, they have ran, they have ran Carthron there. Right. So it's, it's, they do have ran. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's not an example, but if you're like, you know, if you're another team, if you're, if you're the Minnesota Vikings, Minnesota, team, right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a great yeah. fit. Yeah. And you see Trey there and he's from there, right. They, or he played his college ball there. Mm-hmm. And, no, he's from there. Yeah. He's from, he's from Minnesota. Yeah. And you see the fit there and you want him, but you're like, you know, I haven't seen enough on tape. I've only seen four games. Do I even want to invest a draft pick in this? Probably not because you could probably get a seventh round rookie who you scouted, who is younger, who is on a cheaper contract and who you know more about than, than Trey. And and I, I hate talking about him like this because I like Trey a lot. I have the, I have the man's Jersey hung up in my closet, which I'll probably never wear now because it'll never start. But it's just that this, all of this is, is so strange to me that they just gave up on him after four starts and people are like, well, they didn't give up. No, they gave up on him because that's why Sam Donald's here. If they didn't give up on him, Trey would be number one, like vying for whatever first team reps he's getting now in Purdy's absence. Mm-hmm. And number two, he would be solidly there as the second quarterback. It made, if he was the guy at QB two, it, it would make no sense to bring in Sam Donald or Brandon Allen for that reason. So I'm with you, Al. Whoever loses QB two is going to be off the team, and and Probably. they ate salary last year from Nate Sudfeld. They guaranteed him salary. They ate that salary when they let him go in favor of Purdy. So this team is not afraid of of letting quarterbacks go that they've guaranteed money to. I I have a hard time believing that they would release Trey Lance. I mean, again, whether he holds a lot of value uh, in terms of of a trade market, I mean that's to be determined. But they're going to eat. 
tens of millions of dollars in a release of Trey Lance versus just millions of dollars in a release of Sam Darnold. And they still have Trey Lance under contract for another season after this. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously they wouldn't pick up the fifth year option. So at the very least, again, even if you, even if Purdy is the guy, you're still paying for your QB one and QB two, you're still paying $15 million total, even if you keep Trey Lance. So I don't think a release is in the cards, which is why I think a team like Minnesota would give them something of value. And I, I I mean, is it, is a third round pick enough is a second round pick enough. If I'm the, if I'm the Vikings and I know Kirk cousins is gone after this season and Trey Lance is still just 23 years old and he's the hometown kid. I a hundred percent am going to roll the dice and send a second round pick. If that, if, if San Francisco says, yeah, I'll take that. If you give us a second round pick, you can have Trey Lance. I do that in a heartbeat. And not only that, but Minnesota's GM came from San Francisco. He cut his teeth in San Francisco. He went from San Francisco to Cleveland and then became the, the GM in Minnesota. So there's a connection there as well. I, I honestly think the Minnesota, if Trey Lance is not a 49er in 2020, I'll say in 2024, it's be, I, I genuinely believe it's because he's a Minnesota Viking. It just makes the most amount of sense. It's the best fit. There's storylines that work with it and everything. But, you know, this really, I think, you know, and we talked, you talked about it being a disaster, Al, and, and it really, really stems all, and, and you could, you can bring this all the way back to Jimmy Garoppolo's injury plague 2020 season in which the 49ers had just an, a, a crisis of confidence in Jimmy Garoppolo and his ability to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. And, and said, you know what? We got to move on. And we missed out on Brady, right? We probably should have pulled the trigger there. We didn't. But Watson's available and Stafford's available. Let's try and get one of those guys. And then Stafford didn't work out. And then Watson did what he did. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, if we're going to get another quarterback, we're going to have to go in the draft. Schefter says they traded up to three for Mac Jones, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I know it's hard for people to, to, to wrap their brain around that. I was pounding the table for Mac Jones at 12 that year because it was Jimmy Garoppolo Mm -hmm. on a rookie contract, right? We knew that they could win with that. Mac Jones on a rookie contract. Mac Jones. Yeah. So that's Mm -hmm. what I'm saying. If they stayed at 12, I, I even, I think I I put out an article on, on the web zone uh, in the lead up to that draft about how they could easily go Mac Jones at 12. And I think that's a great pick because his skill set is very similar to Jimmy Garoppolo, but now you've got that quarterback with that skill set from that Mm. program on a rookie contract instead of Jimmy Garoppolo's bloated $27 million contract. But once you got up to three, to me, I was like, well, now that you're at three, you've got to, you've got to take a swing. You got to take a swing on, uh, again, I was a fields at three guy on Justin Fields, right? Because, uh, because we knew that uh, Lawrence was going one and it was everyone was confident that Z- Zach Wilson was going two. So now you're talking about Jones, Lance and, and Fields. And I was confident it was Fields. I was also confident that it wasn't Mac Jones simply because mm-hmm. of where they were and what they gave up to get up there. And so really all of this stems from, to me, a an extreme... I'm going to use the word myopic, meaning short-sighted, right? This is short-sighted. All of this to me is still short-sighted because this is a franchise who was in the middle of what they felt like was a solid Super Bowl run. And instead of just drafting a player that they could plug and play, they drafted a player with higher potential, but then shit the bed when it came time to actually say, you know what? We got to give him time to develop and everyone's going to argue they gave him the job in, in 20, you know, they gave him the job at the beginning of last season and he got hurt. And that's true. Mm -hmm. They did give him the job, but here's the other thing, just because you had that successful run with Brock Purdy for eight games, right? How does that now completely move you off of this player 
that that you traded yeah. a ton of of capital for. And to yeah. me, again, it's short sighted in your it's it's almost recency bias, right? And again, that's not to say that Brock Purdy didn't play really, really well because he did. We've talked about that, but you thought this other guy was the future and, and, and we're convinced of that. Mm -hmm. And this guy came in and played really well. It would be like if they gave the job to Nick Mullins after that run that he had, uh, you know, when Jimmy was hurt. Now, granted Brock's run was better. I understand that. And they were winning. It's a different scenario, but it just seems like the kid had an injury and all of a sudden it's like, well, there went that experiment. That experiment is now yeah. over, right? Well, and that, because that seems short sighted to me. But I think the reason for that, Brian, is when they drafted him, the window was larger with this core. So they thought by year three, which would be this year, is like we're ready to rock and roll, and they're not. And now you have, and we, you listen to this show a lot, we've talked about it at nauseum. The window's another year or two with this core. So now they have, they need the guy who is going to be able to take them to the Super Bowl. And do they really have it? We don't know. But right now I think I think Kyle Shanahan and I think the roster believe this Brock Purdy. So fair or unfair to Lance, I think I think that's where they are. And really what this is in the end, it's the long game for Kyle Shanahan to take seven years to get Kirk Cousins, who will be the quarterback next Seriously. year. Seriously. And then he can run into yeah. his arms like dirty dancing in the press conference. That, that is my number time. that is my number one fear that Brock yeah. Purdy is just a Brock Purdy is just a placeholder for Kyle for this this upcoming season, and he's yeah. going to kick him the, as soon as Kirk Cousins becomes a free agent. He's going to kick Purdy to the curb, and he's going to be like, "Hey, this is my dream scenario. Kirk Cousins is a free dirty agent. Dancing. Come on, dirty dad, come on home, come Had come home, my Papa." Life. And I, and I will. I I I, I, up. I genuinely believe if they do not win the Super Bowl this year with Brock Purdy, that is quite literally a very very realistic scenario a very yes. realistic scenario and i hate Oof. it i hate that it's, there is, is no I more think. like aggressively average quarterback than kirk cousins like he shrinks he there is no quarterback that shrinks more in the largest moments than kirk cousins and that's what i'm worried about because you got a coach who shrinks in large moments and you got a quarterback who shrinks in large moments as well so what are you going to do then? Seems like a bad combo. Let's let, let's yes. save it for the off season in 2024. So yes, we wanted yes, to move on. There was a, a PFF article that came out, and I don't know when it came out. I just saw it. But it talked about the Niners' X factors and biggest strengths and biggest weaknesses. And I thought it would be a good thing to talk about. We could see what they said, and then we could react to that. So PFF said that their X factor for 2023 is uh, Colton McKivitz, so that right tackle position. Now, we just talked about the quarterbacks. We're not going to do it again. I think the X factor is the quarterback if you really, really get into it. But they said Colt McKivitz, and they said the 49ers ranked 10th in the league in run blocking last season, which actually surprised me. It was their lowest ranking since Kyle Sheen had been the head coach. So they're a little concerned about the offensive line. I think that's fair. But what I've seen with this team is they've been able to make it work at the tackle position. Now, you have Trent Williams, who's a stud. I'm going to go back to 2019 when McGlinchey and Staley were both hurt and they made it work um, with Brunskill in school. We've seen McKibbins fill in a tackle. We've seen him make it work. So while I think that's important and, and I'm concerned, I don't think that's the X factor. X factor. The X factor to me, non-quarterback, and I won't get into the specifics again because we talked about it in Aussie at the show, but it's the, it's the other edge position. I don't think there's enough pass rushing at the edge positions other than Nick Bosa. And to me, you need this bone crushing defense and they need another rusher. And to me, that is the X factor, even more than McKibbitt's. It's hard because this team has been really good defensively for a long time now, right? And so I think as a fan and 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 people who analyze this game, I think they look to this team and they think this is a defense first team when, you know, at the height of that of that run with Brock Purdy, they were scoring... 30 plus points a game and a shaky right tackle could definitely derail that. So I understand where they're coming from, but I agree with you. I think, I think the X factor is also on the defensive side of the ball. And, it, and it very much is, is related to your X factor Al. And that is Javon Hargrave. And I know that that seems like, uh, like obviously he's going to be good, but what I think we're not, 
we're not focused on is what Hargrave is going to bring as a pass rusher from the interior, right? They sunk money in the interior instead of the edge because to me, in their mind, that production that we're worried about from the edge, you're going to get that from Hargrave. And so that's why they didn't invest in edge as much because they already invested in Hargrave. And so, you know, Hargrave had double digit sacks last year with the, with the Eagles. And so I think they're definitely counting on that again this year from him. And I think if they get that, if they get double digit sacks from the interior from him, I think this defensive line is going to be even more impressive than it was even last year and, and more reminiscent of that 2019 line when Buckner was wreaking havoc on the inside with Armstead. And then you had Bosa and Ford coming off the edge. Now we don't have Ford. And so, you know, that's going to have to be, uh, uh, I would, I would argue probably a committee of Drake Jackson and Cleveland Farrell and uh, Robert Beal Jr., uh, the the rookie out of out of Georgia. Um, but I think again that X factor is going to be Javon Hargrave and whether or not he can duplicate his season that he had last year, where he gets double digit sacks from the interior. I have uh, an X factor and a X factor light, I guess, or an X factor one two point oh, I guess. So my one A and one B. One A and one B. So one A is Brandon Ayuk is my X factor. And the reason why is because I look at what the Rams do with Cooper cup uh, and how they force feed him the ball and how in a big moment, you know where the ball is going. The Niners used to do that with Kittle for the most part. Uh, they spread the ball around really, really well right now. Obviously there's, there's other names on this offense like Christian McCaffrey, Debo Kittle. Somebody, somebody could say use check or even Trent Williams, but, I feel like Ayuk is one of the keys because you started to see his ascension last year and, and he's kind of just scratching the surface. He has first thousand yard, thousand yard season and he is just scratching the surface of his talent. We hear reports all the time and granted camp reports are biased for their, for, for their own team and their own players. But <laughs> we've heard reports about how, how much progress Brandon Ayuk has made from last year to this year in his route running. And if you have a reliable receiver that can get open on his own that can get open in short spaces that you trust with the ball and that can run the entire route tree. That's really hard to guard with all the other guys that you have to guard on this 49ers offense. So Brandon, I, if they can get on the ball, he's, he's my, my number one X factor for this upcoming year. My second one, my, my one B is Talano Ofunga. And he had a fantastic year and he wasn't perfect. Look, he had some, some missed coverages and, and missed tackles and things that, that hurt the team, but he made so many splash plays and so many big plays and so many game changing plays, starting with that this, the prior season in the playoffs where he returned the punt, the block punt for a touchdown in green Bay, which essentially got them back in the game and won them the game. So I'm, I'm looking for big things from him. And at the back end of that secondary, because you may not have as much of a pass rush from, from the edges and you may not have mm -hmm. as, productive of a pass rush there's more pressure on those guys to cover for longer and more pressure on those guys to kind of adhere to their assignments and not and not just free will which i feel like hufanga is a little bit he 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 falls victim to that a little bit but that is that is kind of my guy to watch on defense uh people say that it kind of came out of nowhere we saw it we saw this guy's star potential when in the previous year i want to see if he can duplicate that again because if he can Having a dominant safety changes your entire defense. We've seen it with Earl Thomas, the Seahawks. We've seen it with Ed Reed and the Ravens. You see, and, and it's really hard to come by. There are not that many dominant safeties in the history of this league. And if you if you can get one, it will change your entire defense. All right, PFF next topic was the biggest strength they anticipate for the 49ers in 2023, and they chose playmakers. Talked about offensively, Debo, McCaffrey, Kittle, and Ayuk no matter who was under center, that they thrived. And this is a great stat. 49ers pass catchers led the league in missed tackles, forced, and ranked fifth in the regular season in yards after the catch, despite the seventh fewest targets. So these guys get the ball, and they make the most of it. I mean, it's crazy. And you know what? There's a lot of strengths on this team, and you could you could go to the defense for that. But I agree with it. I, I, I think the offense is almost idiot-proof. 
because you have Debo, because you have McCaffrey, because you have Kittle and you have Ayuk. And then you have really nice role players with Jennings and Mitchell. And there's there's guys that can make plays other than that. So I thought that was a really good choice. And I would agree with that. The playmakers to me are the biggest strength. The defense will be good. The playmakers will, will it, it, no matter who the quarterback is, and with Kyle Shanahan calling plays with those guys out on the field, they'll always, I feel like, be able to score enough points to to win games. And I agree with that. I think it's playmakers. I I agree with that. And and I mean, I don't I don't think you could argue it, it is any other position group. And I appreciate that they did playmakers, right? Because mm -hmm. then you Better can include sure Christian McCaffrey, yeah. right? Because then you can include, or you could just say pass catchers, right? And you could still include Christian mm -hmm. McCaffrey in that. Um but to to kind of shine the light in the same area, right? But just focus on something a little bit different. I would argue that the 49ers have one of the better running back rooms in the NFL right now. And if healthy, healthy. If yeah. healthy. Right. And that I mean, everything is everything has that asterisk, especially with this team, if healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, but as it stands right now, we don't know any better than to say they are healthy right now. Right. We haven't heard any reports of any of them being not healthy. And so the fact that you have Christian McCaffrey uh, m automatically elevates you to one of the best running back uh, cores in the NFL. But then mm -hmm. to also have Elijah Mitchell back there, right, where, again, if he can stay healthy, that is quite the one two punch. Right. You've got a, a, a third year player who had a lot of injuries last year and, and couldn't build on what he did as a rookie. But as a rookie. He was one of the better runners of the football in the NFL. He was mm -hmm. uh, an absolute stud. And then you add to that Jordan Mason, who I think is going to have a bigger role this year. Uh, I think that uh, he, along with Christian McCaffrey, make one of the better uh, pass catching duos in the backfield in the NFL. Uh, and then again, we don't really know what we have with Ty Davis price, but just to have that kind of depth. And then you also have to include Kyle Juszczyk in there, right? Uh, he mm -hmm. is, a part of the running back room and he is the best at what he does. And so to have the best at what he does in Kyle Juszczyk and arguably the best at what he does in Christian McCaffrey, Hey, you know, you're cooking with gas now. So yeah, I mean, it, it, it is playmakers because that includes McCaffrey, Kittle, Debo, Ayuk, Right. But I, I think that running back room, uh, again, big asterisk, as long as they're healthy, uh, I, I think we're going to see a lot of a lot of production out of them this season. All right. Zane had to duck out. So if you're wondering why he's not chiming in on this, that's why. So you're just stuck with me and Brian the rest of the way. Biggest weakness in 2023. So PFF chose interior depth, interior defensive line. Um, and they talked about, obviously, you have Eric Armstead, even though he had a down year last year. But Javon Kinlaw hasn't lived up to his first round billing. Obviously, he has not. And the 49ers ended 2022 with the lowest graded interior, interior defender unit in the NFL, which I did not realize. However, I do like some of the guys they have coming up here. And Kinlaw is the big, big question mark. Because if he's mm -hmm. there with Hargrave and Armstead and he has a decent season, he can stay on the field in good shape. But then Kevin Givens was a really good role player for them last yes. year. He's having Gill and Kelly Davis. I know they're expecting a lot from this year. So yes. I actually kind of like the group. Maybe yeah. I was going to say, I disagree with PFFs. Uh, yeah. I, I disagree with their assessment mainly because how are you going to pick that again with Javon Hargrave as, the, as the, the big addition to that, to that group? But, like, well, he running, lifts, I mean, but Hargrave he lifts a good pass that, anyway. Yeah. But he's a good pass defender, like, you know, good pass rusher, but Maybe they're thinking they can run the ball on, on, on the Niners. Now. I don't know. But how? Know. But how many teams? How many teams are good at running the ball in the NFL right now? Not it's very true. many. Not really built that Not way. very. It's it's a passing league, right? <laughs> like, let's let's you know let's call a spade a spade. Defending the run is arguably not the most important thing anymore for a mm -hmm. defensive line, specifically, but especially even on the interior. So, hey, I'm I if if they're a little downgrade on on. Uh, run defense, but they get more quarterback pressures up the middle than they have the past couple seasons. I think that's a huge victory. So I thought about like, you know, what is the weakness then? I had a really hard time finding a roster weakness. Here's what I think the weakness is health. And here's why I say this, not only because of the quarterback injuries, we know that the quarterbacks can't stay on the field. Kittle's missed games. Debo's missed games. We, we've seen all that. Why I worry about health 
is just sort of like, I guess, just attrition. They've played so mm -hmm. many games. They've mm -hmm. played so many games, 19 games, 20 games. And you go back to the guys around in 2019, it's three of the last four years, really long seasons. Eventually, this is a brutal game. It does take its toll. Yeah. So the fan that worries about everything in me worries about that, that they played long seasons. Can you get, you know, are you going to lose one of these studs? Can something happen? Can something flu fluky happen? We've seen this be an injured team. That is the one weakness I would say is they haven't been super healthy in spots. Can they stay healthy again? Or I should say again, but should they stay healthy throughout 2023? Can McCaffrey stay on the field for 20 games? Things like that to get to another Super Bowl run. That's that's the biggest question for me. And that's where I think the depth obviously comes in. And that's why I appreciate the depth in the running back room. I appreciate the depth. I think there's depth along the interior, whether PFF thinks there isn't or not. I, mm -hmm. I think the so in that regard, I, I think the depth is weakest at edge, as we've said before. Uh, but I, I mean, it feels like, again, not to beat a dead horse, but the obvious weakness on this team right now is the quarterback position. Right. <laughs> like it is, it just is because it's unknown and it's unknown because we don't know who's going to start. It's unknown because we don't know if there's going to be regression from Brock Purdy either because of the injury or just, you know, as, as the league catches up to him a little bit. Um, I, I, I don't necessarily adhere to that idea that with more tape defensive coordinators are gonna be able to figure Brock Purdy out. You don't need to figure Brock Purdy out. You need to figure Kyle Shanahan's offense out. And so far, mm -hmm. no one has really proven to do that. So I'm not necessarily worried about that as much. Um, but I am worried about regression because, He's had an entire offseason where he hasn't been able to to throw or to, you know, work with the team or to be at training camp and and participate in drills and, you know, all that stuff. And so and then you've obviously got Trey Lance. You don't know really what you have in him. And then you've got Sam Darnold, who, you know, 55 games says. Not great, but mm -hmm. tantalizing skill set with an offensive genius and you kind of cross your fingers and go, hey, maybe. Maybe this is what what Sam needed, but obviously it's the biggest weakness. And and outside of that, I think depth on the edge is probably the biggest weakness uh, because you know they the the depth that was there before wasn't just depth; it was legitimate production and depth, right? With Amenahu, with Jordan oh, Willis, yeah. with uh, uh, Ebukam, what, you know, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and, um, now it's, now it's second year Drake Jackson. And we said this before second year Drake Jackson. And then outside of that, it's hopeful reclamation project, Cleveland Farrell and typically mainly interior now Carrie Hyder. And, you know, it's like all of a sudden you're like, Oh man, there really isn't a lot there outside yeah. of Nick Bosa. And here's the thing. If you're, ranking edge units, Nick Bosa is going to lift any edge unit that he's a part of, right? So you can't really call it a weakness because you've got arguably the best edge defender in the NFL as a part of that, as a part of that unit. So mm -hmm. you can't necessarily call that unit a weakness, but like you said, I think, I think depth is, is where, is where I'm a little, a little scared. I think they have depth everywhere, but at edge and that could come back to bite them. And so we'll have to see, you know, we had that episode last week where we talked about whether or not they would sign uh, an, another edge player. You know, we'll we see. think that they should, but will they No, no way to know, but if they're going to do it, they got to do it soon because those guys that would make a difference are going to be gone. So it's, it's scary, but you know, you, you, you got to play the hand that you're dealt and you just got to hope that Drake Jackson takes a step. And it sounds like, you know, it sounds like he's been really dedicated this off season. He's added, I think they said like 10 to 20 pounds of muscle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's not going to be the D Ford speed rusher, but that's what they hope Robert Beal can be. And so, you know, maybe by mid season, Robert Beal has kind of got his, you know, his feet under him and, and he could be that, that NASCAR package, a uh, guy coming off the edge, but Drake Jackson is not going to be that guy. His game is going to be more 
big end, right? He's super bendy and athletic, but not overly fast. He's not he's not screaming at four or five coming off the edge. So yeah, right. Robert Beal was a late, a late round pick. I just I, I have a hard time thinking you're gonna get much out of him this year. Yeah, but maybe, but at the same maybe. yeah, but but if you if you keep him on the team and you go, here's your one job. On third down and long, you're going to go out there and you're just going to pin your ears back and go to the quarterback. With mm -hmm. your four or five speed and your athleticism, we're going to bet on you to get around, right? And if that's his only role and he does that well and he and he ends this season with three to five sacks, I think that's a huge victory for, for a fifth yeah. round pick. Uh, I would agree. Oh, for a pick that late, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I thought, you know, the Niners, the success they had in the 2020, 2021 playoffs, mm -hmm. they just had waves of defensive line yeah. wave people yeah. coming at you, and, and that was it and I, I don't know if they're going to have the waves this year the top end sure absolutely yeah our great Bosa, absolutely but is it going to be waves i don't know it remains to be seen. to me the waves come on the interior now instead of the edge and that's the, that's so. the biggest difference yeah because maybe they, like you said maybe that's what they're relying on is, is the interior yeah. we love what we have in the interior so we're mm -hmm. not as concerned as mm -hmm. on the edge maybe yeah last Last one over under 11 and a half win total. Brian, when I, so when I think of wins in the NFL, three or four plays can be the difference between 13 and four and 10 and seven. It's so sure. hard for me, you know? So I'm like, oh man, 12 wins. Uh, it's, you know, I hope so, but it's tough. But then they said <laughs> Niners are loaded and they went six and oh against the division last year. And I'm thinking at worst, they're going to go five and one in the division. I mean, yeah. at worst. If yeah. they have maybe Seattle beats them one game, but I maybe. the Cardinals yeah. are a mess, the Rams are a mess. So I feel like at worst five and one, and then you really only got to win. Got to go six and three, five. Seven, yeah, six and five or seven and yeah. four. So yeah, I, I'm going to go over. I, I I think they're about a twelve and five team this year, and I I think that's what they'll be. Yeah, I think twelve and five, thirteen and four is not out of the question. Um, would I be surprised if they went 14 and three or 15 and two, probably just because of the uncertainty at quarterback. And mm -hmm. this is a team that again, does tend to start pretty slow and then builds up steam as they go. Uh, that's been their MO. I mean, outside of 2019, when they started the season, what was it nine and oh, yeah, it might've been eight. eight no, it was, it was impressive. Either way, it was impressive. Um, but, but yeah, I just, and, and being in the NFC, you know, I mean, they, they do have a, they do have a fairly tough travel schedule and that could kind of mm -hmm. throw a wrench in things. You know, they've got quite a few trips to the East coast and things like that. So there's always that factor, but you know, in, until when you, when you talk about stuff like this, you assume health, right. And with, with assuming good health, uh, th this is just a loaded team that shouldn't win less than 11 games. Uh, but again, you obviously never know, but I'm pretty confident that, that when the dust settles, it's going to be Philadelphia, Dallas, and San Francisco battling it out for the NFC supremacy. Yeah. Anybody else I think would be a bit of a surprise at this point. Yeah. All right, guys, we appreciate you. Uh, please subscribe. If you haven't give us a rating, like the show. Thanks for listening. For Brian and Zane, I'm Al. Later.